Welcome to Rise Up, biblical teaching to strengthen your heart and deepen your faith. So cryonics is the low temperature preservation of humans uh, that are deceased. It's done with the hopes that through the advancements of medicine and technology, that one day they would be resuscitated, they would be healed. Of course, this can only take place once a person has been legally pronounced dead. And don't worry, uh, you too could have this experience for the low, low price of $250,000 with an annual membership fee, which I'm not sure how people pay. But would you believe that 270 individuals have underwent uh, cryopreservation since it was first introduced in 1962? Yeah, and there are an additional 1,500 people who have already uh, made arrangements and prepaid uh, for themselves. Now, I am the dad of several young children, uh, but this brings a whole new meaning to Frozen 2. <laughs> Just saying. You wonder, like, why would someone do this? Why would someone go to these lengths and measures to see that even after they're dead, their body would be preserved with the hope that one day they might live again? Well, it's because they're afraid of death. It's because they're hoping for and longing for days beyond their allotted 90 years or so. Uh, in fact, the whole premise of the new Pixar movie, Onward, if you've seen that, is a dad who makes arrangements for uh, his resurrection with the hope that he could spend just one day more with his family. But I think that only God has the power to raise the dead. And that's just what we're going to talk about tonight. So my name is John Reisner, and I'm thrilled that you've tuned in for our community Good Friday service. I pray that through our time together, your heart would grow stronger and your faith would grow deeper. So this is Holy Week. These are the days that, that we number as we prepare for the resurrection of our Lord. And we know that on Good Friday, he went to the cross. He endured the shame and the agony of crucifixion. It was the most painful form of execution that Roman minds could conjure. In fact, it's why we have in our English language the word excruciating, which, by the way, I think we use too flippantly, right? We, we get a brain freeze, and we're like, oh, it's excruciating. Um, well, just wait till you're cryogenically frozen. <laughs> uh, talk about a brain freeze. But here's the thing, Jesus, even facing the scorn and the shame of the cross, triumphed. We, we know that Jesus didn't stay in the grave, but he came out of the grave, that Jesus is alive. Can I get an amen? That, that the tomb is empty, that death couldn't hold him down. In fact, Jesus says in Revelation 1 and verse 18, I am the living one. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now, some people like to say Jesus didn't actually die on the cross, but no, it was, it was uh, when he was placed in the tomb that it, it was cool and refreshing, and it revitalized him. Well, we believe that he was resurrected, that he was dead, that his earthly body gave out on the cross. Heart stopped beating, lungs stopped breathing, brain activity ceased, dead. See, this is Friday, but Sunday's coming. And just as Jesus conquered death, he overcame the grave. And after taking the sin of the world to the cross, he has victory. And he lives forevermore. You know, he will return one day as reigning king, and he calls us to join his kingdom and to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Peter preached in Acts 2 and verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So my friends, our hope is not just for this life, but Jesus uh, said, as we know from the crucifixion account, to the repentant thief on the cross next to him, today you will be with me 
in paradise. Have you noticed that the world, the unbelieving world, as they look at followers of Jesus, that they think it's, uh, that our faith uh, is, is a crutch? Like, the concept of God is just something that helps people get through the difficulties of life. And man, it almost seems like we've adapted this same worldview, even as Christians. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, like I believe in God, and that works for me, but you don't, and that works for you. But would you permit me a sanctified challenge of that thinking? No! It's, Jesus is a lifeline to a dying world. He's not some sort of cosmic crutch that just helps us get through life. And our faith is not simply in a higher being. It's not in the man upstairs. It's not in a, 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 a higher power. Our faith, my friends, our hope is in the one true God, the risen Christ. And we believe that the same power that raised him from the dead lives in you and lives in me. So I want to encourage us with two things together this evening as we uh, continue on with our message. And the first thing is to recognize the living Christ. That I, I want to encourage us and challenge us to begin living life with a greater awareness of God and God's activity. We know the teaching of our Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8 where he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now maybe you don't feel like you're, you're bursting with life and energy and enthusiasm. and you know, Maybe uh, you don't feel that resurrection power of Jesus. You know, the coronavirus has you uh, disrupted and feeling down. I think if we're honest, most of us are feeling that way. Uh, you, most of the people I talk to, they're in survival mode right now. I mean, they're, they're either longing for things to get back to the way they were or just hoping for at least a shift that will make things more bearable. But here's the thing. When you're always looking for what's around the corner, you miss what's right in front of you. My friends, don't miss Christ in the crisis so in John chapter 20, we see Mary Magdalene do just that. In fact, if you have your Bible with you, I would commend you to turn there to John chapter 20. We'll be looking at a number of verses together. So Mary goes to the tomb of Jesus. Now we know from the synoptics that she and her friends went there to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. And they discover the empty tomb, and they run back to tell the disciples, and then they all come to investigate, and then everyone leaves the site except for Mary Magdalene. And that's when Jesus appears. So we see in verse 14, we're in John chapter 20. It says, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Like, this is Mary Magdalene. Maybe I need to explain that to you. Like, she's a devout follower of Jesus. This is Mary Magdalene. She is a friend of our Lord, and she doesn't recognize him. This is Mary Magdalene. Not two days earlier, she watched in horror as he was crucified at the place of the skull. And now she thinks he's a gardener? Ouch. Nothing like mistaking the Son of God for a tree trimmer. And I love Rembrandt's painting of this, by the way. I'm not sure if you've seen that, but it's just totally Jesus wearing a sombrero. <laughs> uh, okay, and he's holding a trowel, uh, you know, because like, you would never recognize your friend if he's wearing a sombrero. It reminds me of the Three Stooges sketches that my dad used to always watch. And they're being chased by somebody, and they step into the dressing room of the theater, and they put on a wig, and they go, he went that away. Like, how does she not recognize that it's Jesus? She didn't recognize that it was Jesus because she didn't expect him to be there. Because she wasn't looking for him in that place. My friends, don't we do the same thing? We don't expect God to be in certain places or at certain times, and so we miss out on what he's doing. Like, don't you think that Christ might be right in front of us and we just didn't realize it? So it takes Jesus calling her by name for Mary to recognize that it was him, and then only then can she join him in his mission to spread the good news. 
See, Jesus didn't want Mary moping around. He wanted her to let others know he is alive. So if we are looking for Christ, if we're eager to see him at work, and and we're eager to even join him in that work, we will find him. Oh, it it will mean listening for the voice of God. It will mean pursuing him with all of our heart. But Deuteronomy 4.29 tells us, you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. So the disciples in this passage in John chapter 20, they they hear of this resurrection and they they run to the empty tomb when they hear the news. Like like they were desperate to find Jesus. They were passionately seeking him. Now what makes this even more compelling is that in their culture, Jewish men did not run. It was undignified. It was impractical. It was childish. The, The only other place in the New Testament where a fully grown man literally runs, is a demon-possessed lunatic. (laughs) Like these guys had walked hundreds, maybe thousands of miles with Jesus over the course of three and a half years of his ministry. But now the urgency of this situation calls for an all-out foot race to the tomb. I love that. It doesn't matter what we look like. Other people may say we're foolish, but we are pursuing Jesus. Friends, let's become God chasers in that same spirit. Let's look for his work and look for his hand, maybe even in unexpected places, or maybe even in our everyday experiences. Is that a tree trimmer? Or is that Jesus? Is that a retail worker? Or is that Jesus? If we were to begin life searching for God, like recognizing his presence and and delighting in his mission, we wouldn't be subjected to our own pessimism and and paralyzed by our own fear. I mean, life would be a lot less full of complaining and a lot more full of gratitude, wouldn't it? We'd have a whole lot less anxiety and a whole lot more courageous trust. So you may know what the most common command in all of Scripture is. It's do not fear. Fear. So we've talked about looking for and recognizing the living Christ. Secondly, do not fear. Because of Jesus, we do not fear, not even death. Now, I don't say this that we need to be reckless. Of course, we we find ourselves amidst a health crisis, and we need to be intelligent. Like the great Martin Luther said, we are neither brash nor foolhardy. So in the scene from John chapter 20, Mary is fearful. And she's afraid and she's crying. So let's look there at verse 11. We're in John chapter 20. It says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they've put him. So there are angels at the tomb we see from this scripture. And throughout the Bible, angels appear at these really critical times to announce God's news and announce God's plans. And most commonly, they begin with, do not fear. And so the angels, when they say to Mary, like, why are you crying? It's just, it's loaded with that exact same sentiment. It's as if they're incredulously saying, don't cry. Don't be afraid. He is risen. And, you know, Jesus asks Mary the exact same question. If you look at verse 15, he says, why are you crying? See, he doesn't want Mary to mourn his death. He wants her to celebrate that he is alive. So, my friends, Jesus has overcome our most terrifying enemy. Death couldn't keep its hold on Jesus. He overcame it. 2 Timothy 1 verse 10 tells us, Christ has destroyed death and has brought life. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Okay, so if Christ has destroyed death, then like, why are we in the crisis we're in, and why do I see people dying? Well, listen, as long as we're on earth, we're going to be surrounded by death. Now, the life that Jesus offers, it's after life on earth has ended for us. So, until then, death will still reign as the king of terrors, But listen, praise God that death is not our final end. We have hope in a resurrected Savior. 
that we will be made alive through his victory. So we can say, where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh grave, is your sting? What good news that we have to proclaim, that we are made alive in Christ. Listen, the best way to honor and celebrate that, it's to believe. That's what the disciples did. See, they ran to the tomb and they saw the grave clothes lying there. They were folded up and, and they knew that Jesus was indeed the Savior, the one who could take the weight of the world on his shoulders, the only begotten Son of God, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. So listen, don't trust in cryonics to give you a life beyond your allotted years. Recognize the living Christ who rose from the grave 2,000 years ago that same Christ is in you. That that same power that raised him from the dead lives in you. That God is with us. So my friends, may God give us eyes to see where he is at work. And may we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. You have been listening to Rise Up, biblical teaching to strengthen your heart and deepen your faith. To find more resources, go to johnreisner.net.